Thank you so much all for being here. Um, I actually had the pleasure of interviewing this wonderful person last year virtually, and I'm so excited to continue that conversation. Uh, Sanda is just a, a wonderful, she's been in her role for about, I think in two years in June. Yeah, at least two years in June. And I wanted to start with just a, let's get an assessment of uh, you know, where you are. What do you feel like your proudest accomplishment has been in that last two years of this, this huge sustainability initiative. I think it's 15,000 members at this point on the business side and 3,000 more on, on, on other, other agencies. Right, well first, uh, Heather, really good to meet you in person. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's very odd having spent two years uh, working virtually essentially and, and great to be at this sort of gathering. So, um, you know, biggest accomplishments. I think like any leader who took a role on during the pandemic, I think figuring out how to join an organization motivate an organization, mm -hmm. keep focus on what's really important, develop new strategy, has probably been you know, one of the biggest challenges, yet I think opportunities, uh, in terms of figuring out what this new world of work is like and, and, and what it really means to, to do the important work that we do, but in a very different framework. I've always said that probably the job I interviewed for is, is very different from the job I got because of the pandemic, but certainly the opportunities and the challenges never changed. So did, how have the organization's priorities changed? So you, did, you came into your role, 160 countries? Present in 160 countries, but we have local networks or chapters in about 70 countries. So what did shift? I mean, we, we know that the UN Global Compact is focused on these principles, these principles of human rights, of, of labor concerns, of, of environmental concerns, and, and of course, anti-corruption. Anything shift during this time period? Was there a, did you double down on any particular priorities? I think what has shifted and has probably shifted for a lot of business leaders in the room is the urgency and the need for real ambition and bold leadership. Uh, as we all know, and I think has been said before, the pandemic really provided an opportunity for business to, to step up, business to, to partner differently, business to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so when I joined the Global Compact, I think what was really imperative was to be able to answer the question, what are we going to do with those 15,000 companies? What can we change? What can we shift? What are we going to be accountable for with the footprint that we have um, across countries, across sectors, and certainly with the amount of capital that those 15,000 businesses represent? And what do we do with the business leaders who, who lead and, and represent many of the companies in the compact? So the fundamental question was, given the urgency of the crises around us, what do we bring to bear? And lying in front of us was the climate crisis. And we've certainly seen the UN Secretary General mobilize around that. Lying in front of us was rising inequalities and uh, the, the need for business to really play its role in bridging that gap. Mm -hmm. And also really the, the, the stark reality that the sustainable development goals lie eight years away. And what can we do as business to get us there? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting number, right? They were adopted in 2015. We're basically halfway, everyone. Think about that for a minute. 2030 this is the, is the goal we're striving for. So grade our progress. Well, I think, you know, one needs to have an honest reflection on that. The, the pandemic definitely set back progress. But even before that, I think it was a, a, a mixed and unbalanced bag. Um, and there's some really stark examples about why this is a mixed uh, and unbalanced bag. Uh, look at something like uh, education. And if I look at what happened during the pandemic, many of us in this room or work were able to get online, continue our jobs pretty much seamlessly. Kids were able to join digital school or virtual school. And that happened in one part of the world, but there's a large part of the world where actually technology um, or the lack thereof exacerbated um, gains in, in work, in commerce and in education. And so in many ways, there's been progress on the one hand, but there've been extreme challenges on the other. I think what gives me continued optimism and hope is that actually business has a lot of the solutions in partnership with others to be able to drive that forward. So long story short, the goals have been set back, but certainly with increased momentum and ambition, we can get there. So I'd like to take a two-parter here. Are there any goals, sustainable development goals, where we actually are on track? Well, I, I can't answer that with precision, Heather. And I, I also think that, you know, 
it might not be the best framework of analysis to pick and choose on the goals okay. because they're so interconnected. They, they truly are. Um, at the moment, you know, we are focusing highly on the climate crisis because it is an existential threat. But, you know, underlying the climate crisis is also issues around what happens with gender and how gender is adversely impacted. Underlying that is health concerns, you know, underlying that is many other issues. So I wouldn't want to pick and choose, but I do think it's fundamental that a huge lift is made on delivering on the SDGs as a whole. So let me take the other part of that, which is where do we really need to move faster? A couple of things come to mind. I, I don't want to continue overburdening the climate crisis piece, but it is there. It is existential. All of our future depends on having a, an environment that is in harmony uh, with, with the way that we produce and consume. And so to the extent that we run the risk of leaving a future world uh, very different from the one that we live in, I think that is absolutely urgent. But I also don't really want to, to leave out the fact that we live in a deeply divided world. And I think uh, in many ways we see that playing up. The social fabric has been immensely impacted around the world. You know, economic systems uh, are showing that, that, you know, a lot of inequality is rising. There's huge job losses. Um, the, so the social fabric is broken. You know, we live in a divided world. There's a trust deficit. And a lot needs to be done to bring all of that back in harmony. So the, one of the, I think, things that's become brutally aware, clear in the last two years is the need for a better transparency, better reporting of, of various, everything, of various commitments. Um, and one of, I think, one of the challenges that many people in this room would, would say about the sustainable development goals, many of them have commitments of some sort, but there's no consistent way of talking about how they're doing, of, of actually going back to a con community and saying, here's where we are, we, here's where we need to do, to do better. Do you, do you see the, w what's going to happen here? Are we going to get some kind of reporting framework where, where, that will make it simpler, um, that will make it easier to, to get our arms around? Yeah. There's been lots of, I'll admit, lots of momentum, lots of action, lots of alliance forming um, around the, the sustainability or the ESG reporting framework. Part of it driven, I think, by, by regulation and, and desire to also have a much broader uh, reporting framework, much more than just simply finances. I think we've, we've sort of moved beyond the, the concept that the success of a company is purely grounded in its financial health and really looking at other elements. So hence the broader ESG perspectives. And uh, yes, there have been alliances that, that have sort of brought together key players and I think created frameworks that, that do make sense. And I think what is then really important is there's a couple of questions I think a company should ask itself. You know, one, what are we reporting for? <laughs> because that, that, that initial motive is, is very important. Are you reporting for reporting's sake or are you reporting because you firmly believe it's important to establish a benchmark and work towards continuous improvement and, and be transparent about your reporting? I think that is of, of critical essence. And the second is actually, you know, what do we do with all of this data once we have it? Mm -hmm. Do you use it to make better decisions, to drive resourcing and, and actions in a different or better way that helps lend to your overall company and, and ecosystem success? Mm -hmm. Um, at the Global Compact, we have our own unique reporting framework. We call it the Communication on Progress that we've recently worked to enhance and to digitize so that it will be when we are complete a publicly available um, open source of data on our 15,000 plus companies. Um, just launched a, a sort of early adopters phase and are looking to build and grow from that so that companies can benchmark and, and, and use reporting in a way that helps them make sense of where they are in their industry, in their sector to um, look at other companies in terms of success and look at what business behaviors may be present in them, but also for us to be sure that at the Global Compact, a company can demonstrate measurable progress uh, by being part of our membership. This is something we spoke about last time, last year, around this time, um, the, the supply chain, right? The fragility of the supply chain, very exposed during COVID and clearly not solved by any stretch of the imagination, just uh, disruption all over the place. So from your vantage point, what are the, the most concerning social impacts of these, of this pressure? We've got the, the supply chain fragility and we've got this rampant inflation, obviously not just in the United States, but around the world. What is that exposing? A couple of things, and, and let me just refer to a, a survey that, that we did annually. We do what we call our CEO survey, and we looked at close to 1,200 CEOs and asked them a question about the supply chain and its impact. And, and over 70% felt that during the years of the pandemic, 
the supply chain was probably one of the most fragile areas in terms of not really fully grasping how all the changes globally were going to adversely impact their supply chain. It could have been through closure of borders, changes in, in um, uh, movement of, 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 of traffic and goods back and forth, not fully understanding what was going on, perhaps from a human rights or labor perspective. Mm -hmm. So they did admit the fragility uh, of, of that supply chain. That was the first. I think the second was a piece of data that I saw that close to 75% of any company's externalities lie in that very same supply chain. So put those two pieces of data together. We have knowledge that externalities are outside of what a corporate HQ would look like, but also acknowledgement that sometimes it's, it's out of your control and out of your purview. So, you know, for us, it, it, it really ties into, you know, a lot of conversations that we have with the business leaders around, you know, the overall sustainability framework and your overall sustainability success truly has to take your supply chain into consideration. You know, we often look at, you know, what we call scope three from an environmental perspective, but you probably need to have a scope three for everything. What is your scope three around bribery and anti-corruption? What's your scope three around human rights and, and labor? You know, what's your scope three around all the possibilities that, that allow your supply chain to be resilient and to see you through some of the challenges we've seen through the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So for us, it's, it's, it's an opportunity really for a deep reflection on, on the importance of the supply chain and the importance of really building in sustainable business principles that will help you endure over time. All right. We're going to go to sidebar in a moment for a question, but I, just to follow up that one, what can the larger companies and mid-sized companies in this room do to more intentionally pull those supply chain partners into their climate plans to get, you know, or do you see any initiatives that they could build on or emulate um, to do some of the things you were just saying? Right. Now, you see, yeah, I was listening into the previous speaker, Monero, who I had the pleasure of having, you know, a brief chat with earlier, which was about, I mean, the first thing is that, you know, this has to be done from a corporate strategy perspective. You know, your supply chain is not incidental. Your externalities are not inc incidental to how you do your core business. And I think that is a really important uh, perspective to start with. I think businesses need to take the full ecosystem into consideration, look at who your stakeholders are and, and the impact that they have on your business as a whole. Mm -hmm. So anything that you would do um, at your corporate headquarters, my, my question would be, can you take an analysis of the importance of that work and run it through your supply chain and see what it looks like there? Where do you have gaps? Where do you have improvement opportunities? And how do you leverage your supply chain to truly build resilience in your business for the long term? Mm -hmm. And it's not just the big partners. No, it's all of them. You know, um, we've taken a keen interest in looking at the SME sector in our new strategy. Primarily for two reasons. I mean, one, SMEs drive close to 80% of the economy, but most SMEs also form part of the supply chain of a lot of large and successful companies, but yet they could be their weakest point if we don't take them into consideration. Got it. All right, sidebar. Can we have the lights up over there? And yay, hi guys. Hey, nice to see you, Heather. Um, so yeah, we've got a few questions here, but I'll pick one from it. And it's really, how can we, and I think that means my company, uh, better collaborate with the Global Compact to go further, faster? Great question. Great question. And for any company in the room, I think, uh, you know, working the Global Compact really just first starts with the statement of intent that we asked from the CEO. I think our approach to sustainable business is that it needs to be really driven from a corporate strategy, CEO commitment perspective. So very happy to welcome, you know, uh, companies joining and, and have that leadership level commitment. Mm -hmm. um, embark on a journey of you know, continuous improvement, supporting and driving forward our principles for a responsible business. And really looking at how, as I said earlier, collectively, this group of companies can help shape um, and, and address some of the pressing challenges for business. Thank you very much. Uh, to go back to the supply chain a moment, uh, are there any particular regions where you feel like we really need attention right now? I mean, we talk about China a lot, but what do we need to do in Africa? Are there other regions where we can really make a difference right now? Look, I think that there is immense opportunity for, for business growth and for business sustainability. The challenges play out very differently um, across the globe. Um, I would say in a lot of developing and emerging economies, what, what 
you know, what the huge opportunity for me there is, um, you know, providing an enabling environment for business to thrive, providing more structure, access to finance, an enabling environment and supporting regulatory environment for SMEs uh, to be able to grow and thrive would be one. I think the second, and we see this playing out as we begin the discussions on the road to COP27 and 28, particularly from a climate discussion, is how then we take what is an important global issue and make it relevant and, and, and resonate for, for developing and emerging economies, which is work around biodiversity, adaptation, resilience, making good on, on, uh, on commitments around climate financing and the impact that has on the ability for businesses to be sustainable on the long term in those regions. In other regions, it's issues around human rights and, and labor that we need to grapple with. But in others, perhaps it's, it's, it's lethargy and apathy within the, the private sector and over-regulation. So I think there's balance to look at in terms of how this all comes to bear. And do you have any pilots going on that, uh, again, organizations can build on or contribute to? We have lots going on. I, I hesitate with pilots because we don't want to get stuck in pilot I'm say. sorry, I use but, the but, but, word. But, but we do need to start somewhere on a, a lot of initiatives. But we have a lot of great programming going on in, in areas of gender. Right now, we're launching a program on gender responsive procurement. We continue to work in the area of business and human rights because it's really fundamental to the work that we do. Mm -hmm. We're mobilizing businesses very successfully around the science-based targets, which are really critical for making sure that commitments are really grounded in science and help deliver on promises for 2030 to 2050. Um, I talked about our reporting initiative. So lots going on from a company engagement and continuous improvement perspective. Mm -hmm. We've got only a, just a, a few moments left here. So I want to go back to this, this issue of timing. Um, that, that 2030 mark is looming, but let's, let's go short term because we, we know that short term hard work is necessary for the long term goals. What uh, can we do in the next 12 months? Or where should we really be focusing our attention, we, the collective we in this room, uh, to, to, move, to move this speed and this, this scale quicker? I think a couple of things. I, I would focus on what is most urgent and, and critical within your business. I would then focus on how you can build an ecosystem or a system of partnership to be able to address that. But I think most importantly for me is that I would make sure that it's grounded in, in science and fact. You know, what gets measured, gets managed, you know, you, you, you treasure, you know, what you measure. I think at this point in time, given the challenges we face, it's absolutely critical to be laser focused on commitments. You know, it's not, you know, commitments and action, yeah, or policy and action. I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of good work and good intent around understanding sustainability and the SDGs. I think now we just need to see the actions and the outcomes and business can play a key role in that. You challenged the, the idea of reporting before, you know, who you're reporting for. So, but how can the, the corporate sector be more accountable? Like what, we, we hear that word a lot right now, accountability. Um, what does that mean? Like, what do we need in terms of accountability? Yeah, I'd start internally first. I think any business leader needs to be accountable to self. Um, you know, you, you're running a business for the long term. Right. So the, the very essence of accountability, I think, needs to start within the company. That's the first. I think the second is to look at your broad stakeholders and see if you need to be accountable next to. Um, I think it's important to address customer need, to address regulatory need, to be able to address your, your shareholder need as well. But accountability for me is very broad based um, and it really taps into a lot of the elements that an ESG framework brings to bear. Well, thank you for coming here and provoking some thoughts. It's, and again, it's a pleasure to meet you in person. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Give it up for Sanda Ojiambo, CEO and Executive Director of UN Global Compact. Thank you. Thank you.